from Utah's first TV station, ABC4 News, starts now. Welcome to ABC4 News at 6.30, everyone. I'm Brian McElhatton. And I'm Courtney Johns. Thank you so much for joining us. We are bringing you live coverage of Governor Cox's State of the State Address. That's right. We're looking at a live picture here from the House Chamber in the State Capitol. The theme of the governor's remarks tonight this evening, what makes Utah special? Uh, how that uh, uniqueness can be preserved going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, we know the governor will probably begin here any moment now with some platitudes. You're beefing up Utah, puffing up the chest a little Utah. bit. A lot to say yeah. about Utah. He's a big champion for Utah. Mm -hmm. The room is standing now, so we expect the governor to reach the podium here in a few moments. But we'll also expect the governor to talk a lot about economics. Right. That's a big issue, of mm -hmm. course, across Utah, the environment, the Great Salt Lake, and air quality, too. And that's something that you spoke with him at length about, talking about the inversion as well as the Great Salt Lake. So it'll be interesting to see what he touches on tonight on that. Absolutely. As the legislature wraps up their first week in the Capitol building, here is Governor Spencer Cox shaking some hands as he walks up to the podium there. Um, something else that you'll notice is the governor will probably talk a lot about successes, things from last right. year's legislative session, and of course, words for the lawmakers this year mm -hmm. as they get to work. Uh, why don't we uh, listen in as he shakes the final round of hands here and prepares to give his speech. Okay. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, by the way, this is not in the script, two of the best people on the planet. You. Madam Lieutenant Governor, my best friend, Abby, and to Utah's public servants and my fellow Utahns gathered here tonight, welcome. I want to especially recognize Senator Baldry, Representative McPherson, and Representative DeFay, congratulations on joining the best legislative body in the country. All right, I'm glad we got the clapping out of the way. We have so much to cover in a short amount of time, so I'll ask again, like I did in previous years, to please hold any applause until the end of the speech, no matter how difficult that may be, especially for Mike Maurer in the gallery, all right? <laughs> so, in, uh, in 1847, a group of peculiar people arrived in Utah. But what they found was a place that Native Americans already knew was quite different than anywhere else. Our mountains are taller, our snow is deeper, and our red rocks are otherworldly. We have natural wonders, impossible to describe, like Goblin Valley, Dead Horse Point, the coral pink sand dunes, and Pando, the largest living organism in the world. Am I right, Representative Stratton? The The famed explorer, the people on TV have no idea what we're talking about right now, but that's okay. The, the famed explorer, John Wesley Powell, described his tra travels in Utah thusly. Past these towering monuments, past these mounded billows of orange sandstone, past these oak-set glens, past these fern-decked alcoves, past these mural curves, we glide hour after hour, stopping now and then as our attention is arrested by some new wonder. And the only thing weirder than the landscape, the people who would inhabit it. We have strangely spelled town names like Tooele and Manaway, and even stranger spelled names for our people. While many of us have a grandfather named Lavar or Lavon, now each of us has a niece with names like Sadie or Lakin with extra E's and N's and Y's just strewn about willy-nilly. In Utah, we dine on fry sauce, funeral potatoes, and dirty diet sodas from our neighborhood swig. We play the lottery in Idaho and buy our fireworks in Wyoming. We, 
we, we build rockets in Box Elder County to send astronauts into space. And once they arrive, they can actually look back to see the Utah mine, which produced the copper needed to send them there. And to work in that mine, and many others across the state, immigrants came from all over the world, including our Greek American friends who developed the incomparable pastrami burger, a Utah original. We, we have a Hawaiian ghost town of Yosepa in Tooele County, a gas station in Hanksville built inside a mountain. And I challenge you to find another store on the planet more eclectic than Smith and Edwards in Ogden. <laughs> oh, we believe in the Bear Lake monster, and some of you here tonight are Delta Rabbits and Jordan Beat Diggers. Now, I'm, I'm sure this is all what our first territorial governor, Brigham Young, had in mind when he said, this is the right place. But there's another way in which Utah is different and even a little weird. Despite being a small, oddly shaped state out west, Utah continues to dominate endless lists of national rankings. Utah was recently named the best state to start a business, the most charitable state, and the state with the most independent people. We were even named the number one state for trick-or-treating. This is true. But I, I know that won't stop Senator Colomore's efforts to help us reach even higher heights. Now, Probably my favorite ranking comes from US News and World Report, where they evaluated all 50 states using thousands of data points and more than 70 different metrics in eight categories. Their goal? To determine definitively which is the best state. And for the first time in 2023, Utah was named the best state in the nation, period. And while it's surely fun to tout that ranking, and I certainly have, I'm much more interested in why we are objectively the best state. And I'm most interested in how we keep it that way. Now, I think there are two more rankings that can help us answer those questions. The first comes from a research study on the American dream, which experts simplified into an analysis of social mobility, which in simple terms means if you work hard, you can get ahead. Now, after looking at measures of social mobility in entrepreneurship, institutions and the rule of law, education, and social capital, the study concluded that Utah was the best state in the country for social mobility. The American dream lives here. You see, in Utah, we still care about our communities. We still care about our neighbors. We still believe that we can solve problems and help those who are struggling. We know that we have a duty to give back and lift others. Now, the second st study is, is actually even more fascinating to me. In September of last year, the National Bureau of Economic Research released a robust study on zero-sum thinking. Well, they define zero-sum thinking as the belief that gains for one individual or group tend to come at the cost of the others. So in other words, if you win, then I lose. Now, this type of thinking is deeply associated with a scarcity mentality. Not only is every person out for themselves, but so is every group or identity. And identities become paramount. Race, religion, political party. My team can only win by tearing your team down. Now, this scarcity mentality also leads to false choices. You either care about the Great Salt Lake or you drive a John Deere tractor. If you want to lower taxes, then you must really hate public schools. If you have concerns with federal regulation, then you definitely want to start drilling for oil under Delicate Arch. Now, I promise you, it feels so good to fall into these traps. There's no feeling more enjoyable in the short term than righteous indignation. Sadly, a majority of people in a majority of states are now acting that way, as the study proved, as zero-sum thinkers with endless pity parties and complaints of victimhood. They are buying what the conflict entrepreneurs in our politics and media are selling. But not so much in Utah. It turns out that Utahns, far more than people in any other state, reject zero-sum thinking. Utah still believes in the win-win. We reject false choices and help others succeed. We see abundance in place of scarcity. Utah, it turns out, is profoundly weird. 
Now, our prosperity and abundance mindset was on display in last year's legislative session. Told that we had to choose between reducing taxes and supporting our teachers, we rejected that false choice. Instead, we, you, all of us together, delivered both the largest tax cut ever by a huge margin and, and the largest increase in teacher salaries in our state's history. Even better, over the past three years, we have reduced taxes by over $1 billion with a B. And for the first time, the average Utah teacher is now paid more than neighboring states like Colorado, Arizona, Idaho, Nevada, and New Mexico. But we went even further. We enhanced career pathways and apprenticeships, froze college tuition, and made school choice available to all Utahns. And, and oh, by the way, Utah is now the best state in the nation for providing more per pupil funding to higher poverty districts versus low poverty ones. We were also faced with drought and water insecurity. And we rejected the scarcity mindset that tells us we have to choose between prosperity or water security. Over the past two years, we have provided more than $1 billion in water conservation and infrastructure funding. But even more importantly, the people of Utah have responded by using less water. And while it's easy to convince people to conserve during the driest years, Utah shocked the experts last year by using even less water in one of the wettest water years in our state's history. That doesn't happen. In fact, in the driest part of our state, despite a historic water year and a 5% increase in service connections, our friends in Washington County decreased its total water use by 1.2 billion gallons. This is proof of a paradigm shift. Utahns are doing the right thing without the heavy hand of state government. And the best news of all is that our reservoirs currently sit at 82%, 24% above average. This provides us with a springboard for the ongoing implementation of cons conservation projects. And it means that as we have promised, we will save the Great Salt Lake. Utah's ability to solve these problems has received more national attention, including when Representative Tusher, Senator Colomore, and Senator McKell decided to take on the plague that social media has unleashed on the mental health of our youth. In a rare display of national bipartisanship, I have received messages from Republicans and Democrats in other states, members of Congress, and the President himself thanking us for leading the nation to save our kids. While we still have more to do on this issue, I am grateful for the courage of Republicans and Democrats in this room who are willing to put these companies on notice that our kids' mental health is more important than their profits. Sometimes, though, politics is binary. It's not always possible to find a win-win. But even then, how we win absolutely matters. Oh, look, I know last session there were difficult and controversial bills, including a pause on transgender surgeries and puberty blockers for minors, which I supported. I know there are people impacted who are angry and upset with me and with many of you gathered in this room. I want to thank Senator Kennedy for helping to navigate this debate with compassion. Every other state that has passed this law did it along partisan lines, end of story. And yes, we did the same in Utah. But that's not where the story ends, and that's what makes us different. At the same time, we also unanimously passed a ban on conversion therapy and approved $1 million in funding to provide additional talk therapy for our transgender youth with one primary goal, to help those kids and let them know we want to keep you here. We, we want you to stay. Even when we disagree, and disagree passionately, we must still love. And, um, and speaking of weird, at the bill signing banning conversion therapy, Equality Utah and the Eagle Forum stood side by side. Now, sadly, while almost every media outlet in the country wrote about the controversial bill, this one got very little attention. And yet, it shows 
that we still have the ability to solve hard problems and work together in the Utah way by disagreeing better. That's something that as chair of the National Governors Association, I've been working on with my fellow governors. There's a real desire all across the nation to disagree better, the Utah way, to remember how to stand up for our own beliefs without demonizing and tearing down our opponents. Okay, friends, so we find ourselves at the beginning of another 45-day legislative session. 43 now, to be exact, and I know we're all counting. I, I wish I could report that we had solved every issue, but we know we have more to do. The most pressing challenges in our state today relate to growth. I was recently asked, is Utah growing too fast? Now, this question implies zero-sum thinking. I, I think the reporter was surprised by my response. I said, the only way to not grow is to suck at being a state. Sorry, Mom. Um, and I'm not interested in that. I want Utah to be the best place to live in the nation. I want Utah to be the best place to start a business. I want Utah to be the best place to have a family. And if that attracts people, well, we live in a free country and a free market. Now, don't get me wrong, you guys. I would love to build a wall around our state and get California to pay for it. <laughs> I know that is not going to happen. And so it is up to you and me and all of us to make sure that we grow in the right way. To that end, I believe the single greatest threat to our future prosperity is the price of housing, period. Housing attainability is a crisis in Utah and every state in the country. But remember, remember, we aren't like the rest of the country. No one has figured this out yet, and, and I truly believe that we can. For more than a century, home ownership has been the cornerstone of the American dream. It is the key to financial independence and the ability to break away from government support. Home ownership is also the key to family and community. People who own homes care more about their mayor and school board. They care more about their neighbors. Homeowners have more financial capital and social capital. And most importantly, homeowners have kids, which again, going back to that weird thing, it turns out that all of those late night comedians who made fun of us for having so many kids, uh, guess what? That's the number one reason our state is number one. That is why I have proposed the Utah First Homes Program, with the audacious goal to build 35,000 starter homes in the next five years. While we need more of everything, my focus is on affordable, attainable, single-family, owner-occupied, detached housing. Most of us grew up or started our own families in a 1,300-square-foot home. Our kids and grandkids are desperate for that same opportunity. The greatest generation did this after World War II and we can do it again. The American dream is alive in Utah, but it will be dead soon if we don't get this right. Utah must lead the nation with bold and innovative solutions. Now, there is another troubling trend happening across our country, the growing crisis of homelessness. All across America, in our most iconic cities, people are suffering and dying on the streets. Tents and camps metastasizing. Assaults, shoplifting, and vandalism skyrocketing. Citizens scared to walk down their streets or play with their kids in public parks. But there is nothing that requires us to be like the rest of the nation. I refuse to believe that our capital city must suffer the same fate, not on our watch. Zero-sum thinking says that we must choose between compassion and accountability. We decline that offer. There is nothing compassionate about allowing people to suffer and die on our streets. And there is nothing compassionate about allowing laws to be flagrantly ignored and broken. We can provide help and demand accountability. Unsanctioned camping must end. We will provide help and services for those in need. 
and real consequences and jail for those who willingly break the law and civil commitment when absolutely necessary. Now, when I talk about accountability, I'm also referring to us as public servants and the way these dollars are spent. You deserve to know, the people of Utah deserve to know, where every single dollar is being spent and if it is actually working. If it's not working, then we should move it to a place where it will or not spend it at all. Of course, there are many other issues that need Utah Weird Solutions. This session, we have opportunities to continue supporting our teachers and improving education. We can work to remove unnecessary government regulations. We can significantly increase the number of licensed professionals to help those struggling with mental health. We can strengthen families, including better understanding the struggles of boys and men and providing more opportunities for women and girls. We can continue to close the divide between rural and urban communities, making sure that opportunity exists in every corner of our state. And, and finally, I ask you to support the service initiatives I've proposed this session, especially new paths for high school and college students to give back. I, now, I confess that I still beam with pride, probably more than I should, when I see the flagpole that I put up in our cemetery in Fairview for my Eagle Scout project. Uh, the rootedness that comes from rolling up your sleeves to make the place you live better is a defining feature of our state's culture. And I want to preserve that for your kids and grandkids and mine. So on that note, I started this speech by talking about how weird we are. I'm hoping you will permit me a little personal privilege to share a story about a, uh, a remarkably weird person. His name was Ivan Roy Cox, and he was my grandpa's brother. Ivan grew up in my small town of Fairview. Now, I just thought he was a quirky old guy. He had a prosthetic arm and only three fingers on his other hand. At Christmas, he would come to our house and sing Christmas carols alone with a tape recorder of his own voice so he could harmonize with himself. <laughs> when, uh, when I was 15, he passed away. It was at his funeral when I realized how truly unique he really was. You see, it turns out that Ivan was the closest thing to a real life George Bailey from the film It's a Wonderful Life of anyone I have ever met. I know that now. My great-grandfather had purchased the Fairview Telephone Company in 1919. In 1939, a terrible snowstorm knocked down power lines all over town. Ivan, then age 25, bundled up and went out to help restore phone service. Now, unbeknownst to him, way down the line, a high-voltage power line had fallen onto the telephone line. So when he cut through the wire, with a pair of old, uninsulated pliers, 6,000 volts of electricity shot through his body. As, uh, as he lay smoldering in the snow, everyone assumed he was dead. Miraculously, he survived, but he lost his left arm and two fingers on his other hand. Now, as people always do in Fairview, the community rallied to help and support him. Later, he would marry and celebrate the birth of his first child, a baby boy. Tragically, his wife died just a few months later. Um, again, the people of Fairview rallied to help and support the young widower and his baby. Sorry. In fact, uh, several women in town volunteered to take turns watching and caring for this little boy, feeding him, reading to him, helping him to find some sense of family and normalcy. Now, these two tragic events and traumatic events would have shattered most people. But somehow, Ivan became even stronger and more determined. He figured out how to climb telephone poles with one arm and string wire with three fingers. He married an amazing woman and helped to raise her daughters. He took over the phone company and ran it for 40 years. But more than anything else, he spent the rest of his life giving back to the community that saved him. He volunteered to be the town's scoutmaster, learning how to swim with one arm and tie knots with his three-fingered hand. He bought a station wagon and learned how to drive with his disability so he could take the young men on campouts. 
He spearheaded the local chapter of the Lions Club, volunteering and gathering donations for humanitarian projects all over the world, donating more than $1,000 even though he could never afford it. Ivan wanted to help local families buy their first home or car, but there was no bank in Fairview to lend them money. So he set out to recruit one. And when every bank turned him down, he decided to start the first credit union. Eventually, he convinced Far West Bank to take a chance on the sleepy town. The company he ran was always on the verge of bankruptcy, not because it didn't have potential, but because Ivan was generous to a fault. He donated to every cause in town, whether the company was profitable or not. He refused to send delinquent accounts to collections. He knew what hard times felt like, and, and he was sure he didn't want to make them any harder. Ivan was also a man of deep faith. He believed there was a higher power that had saved his life and carried him through the darkest times. He believed that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of God. He served three missions for his church. And on the, on the back of his business card, now remember he ran a telephone company, read the words, pray, call home often, it's free. <laughs> if a homeless stranger was passing through town, they stayed at Ivan's home. If someone was hitchhiking, he picked them up. When he noticed the elderly in town struggling with loneliness, he started the first senior citizens program. In his later years, I would often um, see him sweeping the sidewalks on Main Street just to make the town a little nicer. Talk about a weird guy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we need more of this kind of weird today. I think we need to amplify and preserve this type of weirdness as if our state's future depends on it. I'm convinced it does. There's a, there's a little park in Fairview today where kids and families come to play. It's appropriately called the Ivan R. Cox Lions Park. I hope you get a chance to visit it sometime. I want to recognize Ivan's son Branch and his family um, who are here with us tonight for their incredible legacy. The, the truth is, the truth is that uh, Ivan didn't change the world but he, he changed Fairview. And I've come to believe that that is far more important. I, I was inspired at our one Utah summit this year by the author and pundit Charles Cook who said this, I often think that we give young people bad advice when it comes to politics. We teach them about the most important and pivotal moments in American history and then we encourage them to go and change the world. For most people that actually isn't an especially useful goal we would be in a better place as a country if people resolved to go and change their town or their community or their local food bank. You see, while the world around us is staggering a bit from war, from loneliness, from contempt, there are Ivan Coxes in every community in this state. At least there used to be. And we need them now more than ever. Fortunately, we're in a room full of them tonight. People like Greg Buxton, Dan Johnson, Mark Wheatley, Robert Spendlove, Susan Pulsifer, Jay Cobb, Marsha Judkins, and Steve Lund. All of you are following in the footsteps of Ivan. For 45 days, you and your families are sacrificing to better your communities and our state. I love you all for doing this. I really do. Even you, Phil. <laughs> and uh, you too, Brian. I love you guys. Look, I only got to serve one year as a member of the legislature. And uh, Abby will tell you that in my 20 years of public service as a city councilman, a mayor, a county commissioner, lieutenant governor, and governor, that one year in the House 
was my absolute favorite. My friends, the state of the state has never, ever been stronger. And I'm convinced with every passing day, the source of our state's strength is what for the longest time people told us was our weakness. We're different. We're weird. The good kind of weird, the kind of weird the rest of the nation is desperate for right now. And I am praying, I'm praying we can keep it that way. So uh, stay weird, Utah. May God bless each of you. And may God bless the great state of Utah. Thank you. And there you have it, uh, Governor Cox's State of the State speech for the year, about 30 minutes long. And indeed, he ended with the state of the state has never been better. Mm -hmm. Talked a lot about all the accomplishments over the previous years and what he's hoping the legislature will accomplish this year. Yeah, very interesting. I, yeah. I love how he ended it saying, stay weird, Utah, emphasizing what makes Utah so unique and right. somewhat different from what he said in his state of the state last year, which was a lot of focus on the youth of Utah and talking about the future of Utah and how the future looks where this year a lot of the focus was on the uniqueness of Utah and also on focusing on staying together and what makes everything so special about Utah. And I know right. you were talking about the fry sauce comment that he said and and how much we love soda, dirty soda. And right. what else did he say on that? I'm trying to remember the exact yeah, quote. Yeah, fry sauce and soda and you know, all these little yeah. mannerisms and folksisms that funeral kind of potatoes. make funeral potatoes. Yes. yes. And so you notice that uh, with mm -hmm. the governor rhetorically, he likes to bring these things up when he talks right. and, and sort of uh, um, offers us this collective sense of you know buy-in, mm -hmm. right? Um, interesting to hear he touched on the environment. He touched on those 35 thousand affordable homes. Right. How will that be accomplished? We may find out. Homelessness, right. a huge issue here. We'll see what the legislature does over the next 43 days in session, and we will be monitoring that, of yeah. course. A lot to keep track of, of. For sure.